Welcome back to the Fun Time Program. I am your host, John Andrew Fredrickson, here with my beautiful co-host, Vivica Volt. And today we have an exciting guest joining us from North Dakota, snowy North Dakota, 24 degrees North Dakota, uh, home for, for a winter break from the University of North Dakota. Alex J. Holt is a PhD student uh, in studying experimental psychology with a focus on applying psychological principles to technological use. Alex, I came across your work on Twitter. Um, I, I think you were publishing some of your research and, and I happened to cross it. And, and I am so interested in how technology is affecting society today. You know, we, we uh, The Social Dilemma was a huge um, documentary that came out recently on Netflix. Tristan Harris, I'm sure you're familiar with, has been talking about these issues for a couple of years now. I came across him on Sam Harris' podcast, um, but basically talking about how technology is taking over our lives at such a rapid uh, growing pace that society only 10 years after the iPhone has come out is now starting to talk about how do we deal with these issues and how do we catch up to how technology is taking over our lives. And, and it's even harder for the younger generations that, that don't even have a frame of reference for understanding life before technology and are being thrust into, you know, becoming teenagers and dealing with all the other issues of that. Um, while technology is also completely radically changing that. So it's so important that we as a society are starting to have these conversations on how we deal with technology. And what's even more important than that, though, is that we have researchers like yourself who are asking these questions and then doing the actual research to come up with hard data to give us better answers for how we deal with this. So we are so excited to have you here in studio with us today. Well, not quite here in studio. You're up on the screen. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. How, are, how are you feeling today? What's it like in snowy North Dakota? Well, I don't think I've seen the sun in a few days, but I'm <laughs> sure it's still there. Uh, feeling pretty good. Uh, feeling pretty good. Uh, just finishing off the semester and um, getting ready for semester eight of the grad school games, as I like to call it. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> must be, must be uh, rough times, you know, a lot of work in front of you, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But it's just part of the Part of the process, I guess. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I feel like we should we should touch on on the pandemic because we're we're nearing the end of it. But being in North Hopefully. Dakota, you guys have been been getting hit this fall harder than anybody else is what I've been hearing in the news. How has that affected your your work and and your school experience? Thankfully for me, the administration at the University of North Dakota, I feel, has done an excellent job dealing with the pandemic. We have allocated. Um, CARES funding to provide testing opportunities, as well as probably most pivotally, in my opinion, the um, anytime we have a student who tests positive or even a faculty or staff member, we have funding that we can use to accommodate those individuals to isolate themselves in a hotel. Okay, like, that's excellent. I feel yeah. like, generally speaking, UND has done a very good job doing their best effort to really mitigate the pandemic. Obviously, the decisions of the students to, you know, follow the protocols is up to the students. But I would say in terms of the, the approach UND has done has been excellent. Uh, for me, luckily, I, I don't really ever have to really see people. I mean, That's I know that sounds kind of bad, but like I'm never really in close proximity with people. <laughs> like I live by myself. I, um, I walk to my office. I have my own office. Nice. Um, so... I actually feel probably safer at UND than I would anywhere else just because I know that I kind of have my little, you know, room Good. where no one else can. Yeah, you get your little bubble. Reach me. That's great. Yeah, exactly. That's what I like to call it. I like to call it my bubble. That's great. So it's almost, <laughs> it's, you've been in a good position then to, to ride out this pandemic. That's, that's good to hear. <laughs> Awesome. So tell us more about, about this work that you're doing. What got you into studying, you know, how technology uh, is affecting people and, and the psychological aspects of that? So I actually first got interested in this. It was my, I think my junior year of undergrad, which seems centuries ago, really. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I remember I was walking around the dining hall and I noticed there were just tables full of students and they just all had their phones. They're all sitting by people. Mm -hmm. They're sitting with people they could interact with, but they're all on their phones. And that kind of just made me think, is that a problem? You know, like, is that an issue? Mm -hmm. And obviously, really, the only way we can really know that is by doing conducting research. Because, you know, um, I could just make my own opinion that it might be bad, but not really the way how we figure things out. So that got me interested. 
that's right. That's how the media likes to handle it. We, we come <laughs> oh, up yeah. with opinions and we just put our opinions out there. But it's so great to hear people like you who are like, well, what can we actually establish with hard data? Yeah, exactly. Right. And that's one of my probably one of my biggest pet peeves is that I feel the media like like I like I told like I've told a few of my colleagues, you know, hearing that something is wrong gets a lot more attention than everything is fine. You know, like people are more of course people are more right. attentive to, oh my gosh, this, you know, the world's going to hell compared to, oh, another good day, you know, no, nothing bad going on. So um <laughs> So that got me interested. I did my... Somehow good isn't noteworthy. So that got me interested in doing a senior honors thesis, which is basically just another way of saying I did a research study and I wrote a lot. Um, I did a research study on (laughs) (laughs) on emotional attachment to smartphones. And we ended up... That ended up becoming my first published paper a few years along the way. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, but wow. the peer review process is a very long and arduous and yeah. <laughs> yes. time period. But um, we ended up finding that the extent to which an individual relies on texting can predict their emotional attachment to their device. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. So while some people might say that's a problem, like anytime you hear reliance, I think it's also important to remember there's a lot of things we, we, reliance on but it's not necessarily bad so for example i rely on my car to go to the store mm-hmm. you know the same way i rely on my phone right. to communicate with people so yeah we found that out and that was my first paper puzzle how are you measuring emotional attachment in in, in that, that scenario, scenario good question we we i adapted this there was this researcher who did a study on commercial brands and how emotionally attached people felt towards them so instead of, so they would have a question mm-hmm. like, to what extent does this, like, does Hallmark make you feel these words? Like, you know, like connected, you know, loving and all that kind of stuff. And uh, right. Um, so I just switched out Hallmark for smartphone. And uh, that's how I derived Got those it. results. Um, yeah, psychology, we do need, we do use a lot of self-report measures, which is, which sometimes that's really the only way you can really quantify some variables. Some of the problems within the smartphone literature, however, just focuses on making scales. Uh, there was a paper that came out, right. I think this year or last year, that said there's been 78 different smartphone addiction measures created in 13 years. So wow. people are just all coming up with their own different measurements and there isn't really a yes. standardized kind of way that people yes. are sharing the same kind yes, of data. Exactly. And, and that must make it hard to draw conclusions across different papers then because people are working with totally different metrics. Yeah, exactly. And, and some of the measures are very much out of tune with, I guess, what a psychological addiction is. So for example, there's a measure that mm-hmm. says, to what extent do you agree with the following things? And one of the items is I send more than 10 text messages a day. And apparently that's that measures that, that means you're addicted to your phone if you use it ten times a day. But that's not necessarily the case. Interesting. Right. But like sending ten text messages, that's either one yeah. conversation in like you're like looking at your phone at one time <laughs> and having one conversation with one person, or you're like looking at your phone ten times in a day. Just out of curiosity, one- how many texts a day do you send, Vivica? Oh God. I that's you guys need a new scale to to take this one into account here. I, I don't I don't, know, I don't know why you have to call me out like this. <laughs> but this is, I think this is the, your point here is that, you know, that when people are coming up with these scales, it sounds like they're a little out of touch with how people are actually using technology. Right. And it's not really helping us answer any questions if if your scale is so completely disconnected from what the reality yes, is. Yes, exactly. There was this one paper came out by, by Linda Kay. Uh, her and her colleagues, they made a friendship addiction scale to basically show that you can be quote addicted to anything you know just based on a psychometric scale right Mm. so what does that tell us then about about how you how you approach the research for this then um basically what it means is that we need to do more i guess more research regarding things that we can actually observe and measure that goes beyond self-report obviously self-report is important but being able to you know look at stuff like screen time you know using different applications like the screen time feature you know, being able to see when people are texting, when they are using their phones, as well as looking at different things such as 
you know, are they using their phones when they're anxious? Are they using their phones when they're depressed? Um, that's another thing within right. the psychological literature is there's a lot of associations between smartphone use and anxiety and depression severity. But the important thing is to look at, at the direction of the, at relationship. While some people may think that, you know, using my phone might cause anxiety, it could be that I'm using my phone to distract myself from my anxiety. Interesting. That Interesting. Makes sense. So how, how do you go about measuring those things then and getting that kind of like fine grained understanding of exactly how somebody's using their phone and what effect it's having on their psychological health? So there's multiple instruments that we can use. We do use the depression, anxiety, stress scale, or, or it's just basically another self-report measure. Um, that's actually used quite frequently in clinician offices. Like if you go to see a counselor or therapist, that's one of the items they'll normally have you use. That's one way in which we tend to measure those types of variables. And then screen time, there's a variety of applications that track that information as well as just the iPhone itself does that. There also right. are some research that uses um, collects these data longitudinally, which is also very important. So they might have a program that sends the participant a text message every day at a certain time, being like and they might give them the, you know, the, the depression, anxiety, stress scale. You know, every day at a certain time. And then they might also look at their phone use over those times and trying to see if there's any, you know, connections between those uses. And and we say they're looking at their phone use. How how are they looking at that? It depends. I mean, you there are different applications in which that the research can access the user's phone use if as long as they have that application downloaded on their phone and they can actually get that data real time. Mm -hmm. I myself don't use that. As a researcher, do you have to build your own applications to do that? Or is this something that you can get access to with Apple's? Because I know Apple has a lot of this information built into the iOS now, and I, I'm not sure about Android, but is this something that, that the big companies are making available to you as researchers? Or do you have to kind of like hire app developers and build your own apps? Um, so for me as a graduate student and with a graduate student income, I tend to use the iPhone uh, for <laughs> Um, I haven't, um, that makes sense. there have been people who have created applications, but again, the problem with some of these applications mm -hmm. is that one thing I really like about the screen time feature is that it will say you spent 12 minutes on, you know, Twitter, you spent 30 minutes on YouTube. A lot of these applications, they're just looking at total phone use and they're treating it all as one metric. Whereas it's kind of misleading. Ah, uh, right? right. Especially since, right. Um, I read somewhere that YouTube is one of the YouTube produces some of the most, I guess, music streams like each year for individuals. Mm. So you might, you might be, you know, mm -hmm. you know, listening to some tunes on your phone for, you know, eight hours of your work day, mm -hmm. but it's going to show up as eight hours of phone use, but that's not necessarily the game. Right. So, right. So there's exactly. definitely a lot of conceptual, in things dealing with methods that research with smartphone use really has to take into account. And it's my hope that wow. we can, you know, not continually make new smartphone addiction measures, but try to find ways to, I guess, address these questions of how can we best yes. look right. at these variables. Yes. Are you familiar with Yuval Noah Harari? Uh, can you say the name again, please? Yuval Noah Harari. He's uh, in Israeli... Mm -hmm. I know he's an author. I think he also. I think he's an historian. He wrote a book called Homo Deus. Um, basically, he he's he's studied the history of humanity up until this point, and now he's trying to project the future of humanity. And he's talking about how technology is completely changing our trajectory. But one of the biggest things that he talks about, um, I'll have to send you a link to one of his talks where he gets into detail about how technology is is affecting us. Is he thinks that technology already knows more about us psychologically than we do about ourselves, certain algorithms. You know, if he, he quotes the example of Target sending a pregnancy ad to a 14-year-old girl and the father getting upset because he's like, why are you sending pregnancy ads to my daughter? And it turns out she actually was pregnant and Target's algorithm knew that before even the family knew it, that kind of stuff. But he thinks that, for example, eventually we're going to have devices that as I'm reading a book, it's going to be measuring my emotions and understanding how I'm experiencing that book. And it would be so interesting as that technology develops for us to be able to get this kind of fine tuned understanding of how it's affecting people. Because right now it sounds like we're kind of like on the outside of the stadium, listening into the stadium, trying to understand what's going on in there, but we don't really have eyes inside yet. 
So is that something that you see is going to be changing over the next few years? Um, I guess it's kind of tough to tell, but I do think that smartphone use and other digital technologies really kind of give us an interesting opportunity to understand individuals at the individual level. So we're able to kind of see different patterns of use and we're able to account for that based on different personality characteristics or psychopathological variables. And I think that's something that is very unique and very interesting. How have these tools changed since you first started your graduate work? Okay, so um, I first my first study ever, we had them do self-report measures of, oh, so not only self-report, but we asked them, how many hours a day do you spend on your phone? And what we have found right. in recent years is multiple studies have had participants estimate that, and then they actually look at their screen time. And self-report estimates are so <laughs> off, so wrong. They either overestimate or <laughs> underestimate. So that's, what, that's definitely a big way in how it's changed. It's changed from, it's definitely changed for the better. Um, because now we're getting more reliable data. Um, that would probably be one of the biggest ways. Yeah. I also just think just like research with different constructs. Like, so for example, fear of missing out, that's kind of uh, one of my mm -hmm. new, I guess, areas that I like to dabble in. Right. Mm -hmm. FOMO. Like it wasn't that big of a research idea, you know, when I started doing research, like it was a thing, but it wasn't mm -hmm. really explored as a concept. Whereas now, you know, it's, if you right. go on, you know, there's papers every so often that get published with it. That's kind of one of the areas I'm trying to focus in on now is just trying to understand why not everyone really experiences that apprehension they're missing out. And with mm -hmm. uh, one of the papers, one of the papers I sent to you, the anxious board of maybe missing out paper, um, that was mm -hmm. that was one that I did um, that looked at that. Let's talk about that. Okay, so what we did was we we have we have it here in front of us. Yeah, first off, um, that is it's my favorite paper. Uh, don't tell my other papers that that that's my favorite. Uh, them all, uh, that's my favorite. Um, we'll keep it between it's us. It's a paper in which we collected a large, diverse sample of people from across the United States using Amazon Mechanical Turk. So one of the limitations, mm -hmm. and another one of the limitations of a lot of the smartphone research today is it's being used in, just on college students. You know, they're just using college student samples. Right. Which, right. I mean, they're definitely active smartphone users, but it's not, right. you know, I wouldn't say everyone in the United States is with that age range. Right. <laughs> yeah. And not everyone in the United States uses their phones exactly like a college student. Yeah, would. <laughs> exactly. And um, so with this study, I got a, I got a departmental grant Shout out to UND for giving me that grant. It helped me recruit a sample from Woo. across the United States, wide variety of ages, ethnicities, political oh, wow. orientations, everything. Mm -hmm. Basically a lot more diverse than what I would have gotten had I just done a student sample. And uh, I used mm -hmm. structural equation modeling, which sounds really intimidating mm -hmm. and complex. But I, it, I understand it, it so it can't does. be too too difficult. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so the structural equation modeling, it is a form of path analysis in which you can estimate the relationships between different variables. But it looks at the structural account. Okay. So if you see with that paper I sent you there, I think it's figure two, I think. Figure two is my proposed model, I think. Yeah, yeah. So figure two, as you see here, we have anxiety and depression. This little circular path here that basically says that these concepts, they are related. You know, so depression and anxiety, they're very okay. comorbid. If you're anxious, you're, you might, mm -hmm. you're more likely to become depressed. And then in there, um, I have boredom proneness in the center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so boredom proneness basically describes how prone someone is to being bored. So individuals who are more prone to being bored, they are more prone to use their smartphone. They are more prone to use these technologies as, you know, boredom is not a fun state. You want to escape that. And that's why we right. go on our phones. Right. right. So we have that there. So we have anxiety and depression. They predict boredom proneness. 
And then boredom proneness predicts fear of missing out, but that is mediated by mm -hmm. anxiety attachment, which I could have better phrased as anxious and ambivalent attachment. So attachment theory is one of my, it's kind of my uh, bay theory, as I like to call it. It's bay. It's a theory I derive a lot of my research <laughs> from. Anxious and ambivalent attachment is this idea that, oh, it's, well, it's probably better I just start off with. Attachment theory describes that how we form our relationships with our caregivers at, you know, infancy is going to impact how we relate to mm -hmm. others in adulthood. So if you have a child and every time they mm -hmm. cry, their caregiver is there for them, they're going to grow up thinking, I can trust people. You know, I, I can trust people. That's great. Whereas... Mm -hmm. I had that problem as a child. I thought I thought I could trust people, and then I went out into the real world, and I was like, "Wait a second, what have you guys been teaching me here?" <laughs> These people are trash. I mean, attachment definitely can change over time. That's uh, definitely is a good point there. Um, whereas uh, children who grow up with their parents sometimes responding to them, sometimes not, they grow up being more anxious and ambivalent. And so these individuals, they tend to be very clingy in relationships because when they grow up, because they don't know if their partner is really going to be there because, you know, in the past, mm. their idea of an attachment figure was never really reliable. So, wow. um, yeah, I have this particular interest in anxious and ambivalent attachment. And um, there's been research that show that these individuals are more prone to Facebook stock their, partners just make sure that they're not checking into places this they didn't say they were going to go to they're probably pro pro probably more mm -hmm. more confrontive of oh i saw i saw you like that picture of someone what's that all about yeah you know, right that kind of stuff yeah and um so a big thing with them is they they're always preoccupied with the availability of others and if they're available so what i found within this study is that while boredom proneness itself predicts fear of missing out, the extent to which someone has anxious and ambivalent tendencies is going to impact um, if they actually have a fear of missing out. So in other words, someone who is very high in boredom okay. proneness and very high in anxious and ambivalent attachment, they're going to probably score really, really high in fear of missing out. Interesting. So is that what you actually found in your research then? Yes. Yes. So, so, so essentially you're establishing um, what are the relationships between these different characteristics mm -hmm. in a large population? Yep. Fascinating. Yeah. And so originally wow. I thought it was yeah, going to be anxious and ambivalent attachment was going to be right, was going to be where boredom proneness is in that picture. Mm -hmm. But I ran, I ran the model and then I ran some competing models and I found that this one was actually just a little bit better. Okay. Now, when you say it's a little bit better, does that mean that, that they both have some both models had some merit within the population? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So boredom okay. proneness and anxious and ambivalent attachment, they, they can be both regarded as a cognitive and effective variables that influence these psychopathic, these outcomes, I guess you could say. So you can also see this in research with, um, so smart, the terminology of smartphone addiction is kind of frowned upon with, Probably about half of the empirical literature, like, but problematic smartphone use tends to be used. So, boredom proneness and, and anxious and ambivalent attachment, they're also more of these mediator variables with uh, problematic smartphone use. And when I mean mediator, I mean the sense that we all know that anxiety and depression predict these variables. But right. by, by accounting for these other variables, we can explain even more about the phenomenon. Ah, uh, got you. That makes sense. So, so this is basically you're you're attempting to predict, you know, based on certain variables that that are um, you know part of somebody's psychological makeup. Mm -hmm. You can predict how likely they are to be affected by a fear of missing out. Yes, is that accurate? Yes, got you. So it's it's not just whether or not you know they have anxiety and depression. It's whether or not they have um, anxiety attachment. Whether or not they are prone to board to boredom and and those those things play a big role in their relationship with a fear of missing out yes absolutely so i guess a good example of this is someone could be very anxious and very depressed but if they're not bored they're probably not they're not going to have a fear that they're missing out because they're already experiencing something enjoyable interesting right. Yeah. That makes sense. Interesting. Idle hands are the devil's something. What's that quote? <laughs> yeah, the devil's playpen toy. 
<laughs> so, but, yeah, so that makes sense. So, so what would you do with information like this? Is is so is your research only focused on kind of like establishing the hard data, or do you do you take some of do do you take this data when you're able to to put it together like this and and put a, put out a paper like this, and do you kind of come out with ideas for how can we use this information to affect change in society? Yes, yes. So one of my other papers, I sent you my True Colors, the True Colors paper. Yes, I love that paper. I think that's the one that I came across on yeah. on Twitter. I was like, this is so fascinating because you're talking about, you know, actual ways that we can change, you know, make changes yeah. and have a very real effect. So this paper is titled True Colors, Grayscale Settings Reduce Screen Time in College Students. What led you to, to having this idea? So I'm going to first start off by saying that I, the title of the song was named was named after the song by Kesha and Zed True Colors. Oh, um, okay. Okay. Nice. Yeah, I like that. Um, so a big thing here at UND is our hockey program. We have one of the best hockey programs in the country. Like, like everyone goes to the games. It's a big deal. You know, students wait in line and, negative 20 degree weather for multiple hours it's wow it's a big that deal sounds like ohio um, state with our football yeah um thankfully for me my office is like five minutes away so i normally wait until they open the doors mm-hmm. and then i just kind of go right in there but um Perfect. so they always played these songs you know like these entrance songs and they kept on playing this song mm-hmm. it was a true color song and i had no idea who sang it i had no idea for like 12 games into the season like i didn't know until public like february <laughs> So once I finally learned, I'm like, wow. all right, this is a, all right, this is a jam. So I started listening yeah. to it a lot, and uh, um, I just I kind of named it after that. But so I, how I came across this idea was again, like you mentioned, John. There's a lot of research that's being done, that's basically saying, hey, these things are related. That's cool. But I mm-hmm. feel like research needs to go beyond identifying these constructs, and we need to actually, you know, do some something viable something that can actually help people. And um, so I learned about this grayscale challenge thing online somewhere about how it makes people's phones less appealing. So then I was like, well, well, you know what, let's let's try it out. And I'm like, oh, this is like a whole world, you know, you know, uh, so I had my phone in grayscale and um, definitely. Is this something that people are able to try out? Oh, on yeah. their own is this a setting built into oh, yeah, absolutely it's actually within the accommodations feature i believe the fun thing about doing research with these technology technological concepts is when apple makes new changes to, the, to their ios and completely throws oh. <laughs> a lot of your protocols off i think it's under accommodation is it accessibility yeah accessibility yeah accessibility displays and text size color filters and if you just Put the color filters right here on. Oh my God, grayscale. This is bizarre. So for, for yeah. our listeners uh, watching or, or listening at home, if you go to, if you're using an iPhone, I'm not sure what the Android, do you know if there's an Android version of this there as well? There is an Android um, version. I believe I'm there is. Give the I believe Android you can do it on Android. We're going we're to get that in two seconds, but let's do the iPhone one first. So you go into your settings in the iPhone, you go to accessibility, um, and then you click on uh, display and text size. Right. Accessibility, display and text size, go to color filters to hit on. And then you have options for different color filters and grayscale is the top one. And boom, you have your phone in grayscale. I'm going to try this for the rest of the day because this is so interesting. Do you have the Android version yet? I am looking for it. Is there an accessibility under Android? Sorry, we're going to get back to your your paper in a second. We just want to make sure people are able to follow along with this because I think this is so interesting. No results found. Not coming up. So we're going to have to we're going to have to figure that out at another time. But um, yeah, so so you had this idea to actually do research based on mm-hmm. what happens when people change their 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 phone yep. colors. Yeah, absolutely. So tell and us how that worked. So what we did was we recruited participants from the University of North Dakota. We had them do some baseline measures. So we, you know, again, we were looking at anxiety and depression. We looked at their screen time. And then we um, randomly put them in one or two conditions. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. either they ha- had their phone in black and white or they didn't. And uh, the ones who didn't, right. they had. So you had a control easy. group. Yeah. Yeah. We had a control group to compare them to. And uh, the people who got. Which is control- so interesting because because one of the one of the fears is that people are going to change their their screen use regardless as soon as you put them into a study. Right. So you mm-hmm. have the control group to find out, you yep. know, just how did people respond without any changes to their phone, but they're in the study as well versus how do people respond in the study with these changes? Yep. So, so we got all that information. Uh, The people who got the control group, they kind of were 
quite lucky that I didn't have to do anything different for the, that eight right. days. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was it was between eight to ten days for the first study. We did a replication of the study as well, but anyways, with the first study, okay. we uh, they would come back, they would do the same measures, and then we would leave them alone in the room and have them do a post survey, basically being like, "Hey, did you actually keep your phone in grayscale?" Mm-hmm. If, okay. And if they said no, then we asked them why. You know, what stopped you from having your phone in grayscale? And then we. Um, we excluded those participants from data analysis. What kind of answers did you get? I'm very curious about that. Oh, it was it was a hodgepodge, a lot of a lot of really interesting <laughs> stuff. Um, so we had a, a batch of participants who did the study during Greek life recruitment. So oh, uh, oh no, I would have stuff about how how they how they stopped the study because they had to edit some pictures, and that was one of the really common uh-huh. things where people. And needed to edit their pictures, and they couldn't tell, you know, what it looked like. Um, I would say the vast majority of people who did switch their phones, it was for reasons like that, or it was stuff kind of like, oh, I was shopping online, um, and you know, I couldn't see what stuff looked like, and it really kind of opened my eyes to the sense that a lot of people are using their phones for like everything. For online shopping, I normally do that on, on you know, on my computer, you know, mm-hmm. but. A lot of people, like, you know, they do everything on their phone. And yeah, and that's part of the reason why when I see smartphone addiction scale items about how, you know, if my phone broke, I would get a new one immediately. Well, yeah, I mean, right. we do everything. On we them. do everything on our phone. Of course, we're going to get a new right. one. It's like if you're commuting an hour every day and your car breaks, you're going to get a new one immediately. You know what I mean? That's yeah. not because you're addicted to your car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I think part of the thing is some of the researchers making these scales, they they themselves don't really have a smartphone. You know, they don't. Oh my god! Wow, you gotta be like, kidding me! How, that... how are you alive in like <laughs> the like? That reminds me of Congress 20, 20, 2010. That's like Congress doing healthcare legislation, but none of them understand any of the issues or, or have ever worried about healthcare because they've always had healthcare Perfect their entire healthcare. lives in Congress. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's so crazy. So so that's why it's so important to have people like you coming in from the younger generation who actually is living this and is surrounded by people living this and actually have the perspective of of what types of questions we need to ask and and what do these questions mean? Because somebody who's been doing research in psychology for 30 years and mm-hmm. has never used a cell phone because, you know, whatever, they're or in their ivory phone, tower. Yeah. It's like mm-hmm. they're, 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 they have no frame of reference to understand this stuff. That's so interesting. So yeah, interesting. And I was actually on Twitter uh, the other day in – um, one of the one of the uh, premier fear of missing out researchers, Andrew Shablinsky, I think I said his last name right. He tweeted something to the extent: if every behavior is can become an addiction, then nothing is. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god, I'm um, trying to take notes on my phone right now, and it's in grayscale. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> freaking you out already. It's yeah, hard. No, yeah, like um. Oh yeah, with and then I guess with the main findings of that of that study is that we found that participants on average, they use their phones, I think something around almost 40 less minutes each day. Wow. And, just having it on grayscale. Yeah, just by having it on grayscale. But again, the important thing wow. about, so originally that was kind of like the big finding that we had. We were like, yeah, like, all right. Like, that's probably, like, I would say as, as a graduate student, as a researcher, like, I'm just living the dream. Mm-hmm. Like, I just love every part of the process. But especially at the very end, when I you click it. enter and it runs your data and you have, like, you know, good results, you're just like, oh, my gosh, like, let's go. Like That's so good. Um, That's such a great feeling. Yeah, especially because it takes so long sometimes to collect this data. So uh, we collected right. all that all that data in one semester, but then the replication study took three semesters. And then, wow. but one of the important things with the original study that we found is that those screen time decreased by 40 minutes a day on average, anxiety and depression severity did not. Oh, whoa. What does that tell you? That tells me that it's important to really look at specific features of smartphone use. Because again, Mm. If you're just looking at total screen time, you know, who's to say, you know, they might not be on Facebook for 10 hours a day on their phone anymore, but they might still be on 10 hours a day on their computer, you know? Right. Interesting. So again, it kind of goes in that methodological battle that we have. But however, in our replication study, which 
I've completed it. I'm done writing it. I'm just waiting to finish my comprehensive exams to submit the paper because I just want to wait until a better day, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of it off. In that study, we did find that anxiety did go down significantly. Okay. Oh. Um, which again, we had conflicting findings there. So we need future research needs to kind of look at that. But in addition, we used the measure of problematic smartphone use and we saw that that went, that was significantly different for those in gray scale. So huh. different in what way? Well, in our first study, we didn't include that measure. A problem max smartphone okay. use. But in the second measure, we found that individuals who were in the grayscale condition, they scored significantly less in problem max smartphone use after a week of having their phone in grayscale. So uh. the main finding of this is that, so again, problem max smartphone use, the social dilemma makes a lot of statements. Some of them are, are well, some of them are not very well. But one of the things that they are very mm -hmm. accurate about is that these devices are are made to retain and obtain our attention. And, right. Mm -hmm. But the idea with the grayscale studies is that we find that when you put your phone in grayscale, you reduce the salience of these desires to come back for more. Kind of right. Mm -hmm. So if uh, one of the things, so I actually occasionally do put my phone in grayscale anytime I have a big paper or something, you know, that I just have to get done. I don't can't afford mm -hmm. for distractions. That's awesome. So I wonder if, if I wonder if we're going to see more, you know, there's a ton of people kind of study, I don't want to say study is the right word, that write about, <laughs> you know, productivity hacks and that kind of thing, how to like make yourself more productive. And and yeah. I, I bet we're going to start seeing more and more people recommending that like, hey, when you really need to focus, because people have written apps for like, you know, Chrome browser or whatever that blocks your social media for X number of, of hours or whatever. I, I bet this is going to be another recommendation that you're going to see people making. It's like when you need to be really focusing, don't just put your phone in airplane mode, put it on grayscale as well mm -hmm. and, and you know, or turn it off and put it away even better. But that's not always an option. One question I have about the grayscale uh, setting, and this might require future research, is mm -hmm. the first thing that I noticed putting my phone on grayscale is that immediately things become unrecognizable because when you use your phone every day, like let's say I go on my phone, I want to find Twitter. It's bing, bang, boom. I'm on Twitter. I'm doing what I need to do. As soon as I put my phone into grayscale, I'm like dis disoriented a little bit. Mm -hmm. There becomes like a, a, a bigger burden for me every time I open my phone to figure out what I'm trying to do. And I think that that burden slows me down and makes me less adept at using the phone and makes it maybe less of a reward mm -hmm. if we're seeking out a quick dopamine fix or whatever, mm -hmm. you don't get it as quickly and as easily. And that makes you less likely to seek it out, which could, could be an explanation for why people are therefore then using their phones less on grayscale setting. What I wonder is, would your brain eventually adapt to the grayscale setting if you used it for long enough? And would you see those numbers sort of normalize again? And it, it, it would, I guess you'd have to study that over a longer period of time. I'm, I'm curious about that. What do you, do you yeah, have any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things that, that I, we address kind of towards the end of the paper is that future research needs to see how effective this is and as a long-term solution. Um, I guess, ideally for me, I feel like I don't need to have my phone on grayscale for that long of a period of time. It's more of like, you know, finals week, you know, something like very, like maybe a little bit beyond a week, but it would be interesting to see that. Um, right. Because mm -hmm. again, like these bright colors are psychologically appealing to look at. And they're and, designed specifically. I mean, they're, they're running, yeah. these companies are running tests over and over again yeah. to figure out what is the exact best layout color design? What does the button need to look like? How do we reward you when you click this button? What shows up on the screen? All of that is being tested, you know, to infinity to find out exactly, you know, what is the most effective uh, way to get people to continue using the apps. And so it's interesting to think about what can we do as users to kind of like regain some control over how we're being manipulated. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's almost like if you're in a casino, if you had some control in the casino about how the casino is manipulating you into continue playing that slot machine, obviously they're never going to allow that in a casino, but it mm -hmm. seems like the smartphone manufacturers actually do have some interest in giving users some control back over these kinds of things. Why do you think that is? So is your question about why these companies are, are trying to give people control back? Yeah, why so why is Apple enabling grayscale? Why why are they giving us screen time data? I would say part of it probably is public pressure. 
as people are starting to become more aware of this, you know, they, you know, as they say, image is everything. So they don't want right. to have this image as this, you know, company that is, you know, systematically changing people and systematically right. impacting how people behave. Yeah. It feels like they're covering their ass a bit. Do you think it's possible that there is a, a slightly different incentive for the manufacturers like Google and Apple versus the app developers like Facebook and Twitter, where Facebook and Twitter and these other app developers, it is totally their main incentive to get as much screen time use as possible out of their users. Whereas with Apple, yes, they want to have, have people using their phones, but it's, it's important for them that their users have a long-term healthy relationship with their phone. And if individual app developers are taking advantage of that in a way that gives somebody an unhealthy relationship with their phone, then maybe that's a, not a good thing for Apple and Google. Like Google's a weird situation because Google is not just the smartphone manufacturer, but they also have the software services that they do need to maximize you. Whereas Apple, I don't think necessarily cares about how much you're using the books app or how much you're using, you know, your messages app. They just want you to be functional with it. So it seems like there there might be some incentive for Apple to care about, you know, the long-term health of their users, especially if they know that their app developers are manipulating them in ways that might not be healthy. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, as soon as you buy your iPhone, you know, job done for Apple, you know, like, like they have, right. you know, they have received your funds. That's all that matters right. at right. that point. But for these, you know, app developers, you know, they, they need you to use, they need you to use your devices. They need you to buy, you know, you know, in the case of like different, you know, application games, they want you to, they want you to spend more money on like, you know, different avatar items. They want you to spend, you know, right. You know different things of that nature. There actually is a book by by Nir Eyal called Hooked, and so he basically talks about this model, this hook model, that basically all applications use to get users hooked. And again, it's not mm-hmm. necessarily in the addictive element, but more along the lines of habitual and the idea of you right. know making making certain uses just the habit. So, for example, when a lot of people wake up, they may check a certain application. That's that's the end goal of it for these developers. So, one of the social dilemma talked about this is about reinforcement and about how people they'll mm. use different reinforcement to get people continually come back and check. And um, right, and that's kind of one of the main things about it is that you know. People are constantly reinforced, and then they also can make they also make investments that make it difficult to leave. So a lot of people say they're right. going to leave Facebook, but chances are they might just have their picture stored on Facebook, they, you know, or, they, right. or or Instagram or Visco. They might, you know, some people they don't have, you know, that, that might be all their pictures and the idea or their contacts. That, yeah, and, and contact many is, people they have contacts on Facebook. That they have no other way of contacting that person. They don't. They don't have their their cell phone number or, or email address because they've only ever used Facebook to interact with them. So that becomes yeah. something that ties you to the platform. Exactly, and I mean, I think Facebook is good in a lot of senses, like especially for a like communication. Like, I think we've all seen someone lose lose a cat or a dog, but they posted on Facebook, and now you have you know an entire community that's aware that we need to look for this dog if we see it. Exactly. That variety. Exactly. And I think that's one of the issues when it comes to research on technology is, I guess, not really an issue, but one of the, so my second comprehensive exam, I'm writing an integrative research paper on existing research about smartphone use and if it should be recognized as an addiction. And one of the, Mm -hmm. one of the interesting things about it is compared to other things, you know, Technology just by itself is not necessarily bad. It's actually kind of good in a lot of senses. Whereas, you know, mm-hmm. drugs, alcohol, all those types of variety aren't can be very helpful. So, for example, in January when I head back home, no, sorry, yeah, when I head back to UND, if I, you know, sadly end up in the on the side of the road with car problems, you know, alcohol and tobacco mm-hmm. alcohol and tobacco is not gonna help me a lot, but my phone will. And right. right. And that's part of the thing is that one of the things that really kind of makes smartphone use different in that sense. Um, is right. that so our- it's so interesting. So you've talked about how it's so important to separate the different types of use yep. within smartphone use and figure out 
if we're going to be measuring, you know, negative consequences of smartphone use, it has to be negative consequences of a subset of smartphone use. Right. Mm-hmm. In other words, it's not yep. screen time in general. It's like certain types of screen time. So yep. how do you identify what types of screen time are, are detrimental or problematic? I guess what you'd, what you'd have to do is you would have to get that, get that particular screen time metric. And then you'd have to look at if it relates to problematic smartphone use in the longitudinal sense. So again, over time. Got you. And I think, again, one of the issues with that is there's so much issues of context when it comes to mm. these uses. So for example, if someone has a, you know, a long distance partner, you know, yeah, they might, they might spend a lot of time on Snapchat, but that's how they connect. Right. right. That's why it's also important to also account for their mood and affect during that time as well. Of course. And it's all very complex. We definitely have um, some work to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, it's, very, um, it's very challenging as a researcher to, to be looking at, you know, how difficult and complex these issues are because you have to then somehow figure out a way to distill it down into very specific variables that you can measure yep. and, and then try to have like concrete things that you can say as a result of that, knowing that there's so many other variables that go into it that you're maybe not able to completely measure yet. That's so yes. challenging. Yes, exactly. And so, for example, there was a research paper I read that showed that the number of times an individual checked their phone was inversely related to how depressed they were. So in other words, individuals who check their phones more frequently were less depressed compared to those. Oh. Who, I know, like it's, and it's, it could it be maybe that since they have that reassurance that, you know, they're in contact with people, maybe that, you know, helps them out. This, there's definitely a lot right. that really kind of goes into play with that. Um, I you, also yeah. wonder yeah. if it depends on what they're checking their phone for as well. Yes. Like if you're just checking like stocks or if you're just checking like sports updates or something, that's not going to give you the same like dopamine hit as like getting a text from a friend or sharing a meme or or something. even or even just if you're checking your phone as a response to a notification versus checking your phone because you want to know is there yeah. something I missed right because if you're checking and you haven't been told that there's something that might be a sign that you're kind of anxious and you're like did somebody text me I'm waiting to hear from somebody whereas if you're getting a notification you look and you put it away like that's probably a healthy response. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Interesting. I think I forgot to mention this earlier with the grayscale study, but um, notifications are red for the purpose that red causes anxiety in people. When we see red, we get anxious. Yes. Yes. So mm-hmm. that's part of the reasons why we have notifications that color is it, it you know, it's going to stay red until you check it. Well, one of the things I'm kind of interested in, I mean, I don't know if I would ever do a full long research study because the process of doing research, you know, you have to get approval from, from the institutional review board. It, you have to get approval mm-hmm. from a bunch of people. So I don't know. I have a lot of things that I'm just kind of thinking, hmm, I wonder, but not necessarily like a full blown study. Um, I think we all know people who they can have 20,000 unread emails. And that's perfectly fine. You know, or 20,000. Oh my God, I get such anxiety. And if I look at somebody's somebody's phone and there's like 20,000 notifications, yeah. I'm like, I can't even look at it. It, it freaks me out. Yeah. yeah so I that's clear one of the things I'm inter- kind of interested is, you know, like, is there a psychological How do those people trait? function? Oh, interesting. Is there something that you could actually understand on an underlying yeah. level that makes different people different? Yeah. That's amazing. Do you have any ideas of how you would establish that? That's a good question. Um, maybe just have them come into the lab check their phone, see how many notifications they have. But before you would do that, you would maybe have them do maybe a personality measure or some mm-hmm. type of trait of some variety and then just run mm-hmm. some type of correlational analysis and see if you can have any relationships in those areas. Another thing you can maybe do is maybe have participants in separate conditions Maybe in one condition, you give them a phone that has a thousand notifications or you give them a phone that has one notification and compare to -hmm. see if their state or uh, if their state measures of anxiety increase as a result. Oh, right. I mean, yeah, interesting. This is an idea out there, I guess. Um, I guess one of the ways the pandemic has affected 
us is that we're not doing in-person research right now. I would hope not. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> um, a lot of a lot of the research I'm currently looking forward to doing isn't relying that in-person component because again, mm-hmm. we don't know how long all of this is gonna, you know, happen. And um, I'm right. I'm really excited though about the vaccines being shipped. That's yes. yeah. I would say that's probably the biggest science win of probably, you know, the decade, like, or even longer. Yeah, absolutely. Right. How quick they did that. They yeah. got that done in under a year. That's insane. Unbelievable. And apparently one of the vaccines was uh, created in two days. Well, that's what's so interesting is, is you know, the, the, the work that it takes to create the vaccine is one thing, but then the time it takes to get it out it. is the is the running the studies but like, and showing that they're safe and showing that they actually are yeah. effective and, and convincing people that you're doing it in a, in a legitimate way and not just like cutting corners. And right. It's been unbelievable how fast they've, they've made that happen. Mm-hmm. We're hoping to interview some people that were inside that that bubble if we can get a hold of them once their their crazy <laughs> year is over because i'm sure they've just been non-stop this year <laughs> yeah, yeah i guess another thing i thought of about the grade skill study i would say maybe every every so often i would see students having their phones was out in public like in black and white and i'd be like i'm the reason for that <laughs> right isn't that lovely that's amazing yeah. that a cool feeling where you're just like haha i did that that is and, amazing how do you see your work influencing, you know, society in the future? Like you're talking about these other studies that you want to do. Uh, do you have ideas for what you want to do after your 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 um, your studies? You know, once you get out into the the real world, so to speak, do you have um, ideas for you know places that you would want to work to continue this work, or do you see yourself at a place like Apple, helping Apple understand these issues so that they can implement better features, or maybe at a foundation like Tristan Harris, the guy who did the social dilemma? I don't don't know the name of his foundation but they're they, they're brand new and their whole thing is researching this stuff and coming out with ideas to like give people advice on how to how to deal with this where do you see yourself fitting into that well for me personally i would probably i would prefer going the academic route mm-hmm. but ultimately i'm really open to really anything that you know i i'm happy at and i you know feel fulfilled and what i'm doing it's kind of crazy i've been you know, doing this school thing for so long now, it's kind of getting to the point where it's like, oh, I get to be a, no- I get to be a normal person. I get to not be, you know, a 28 year old college student, you know? Um, right. <laughs> so yeah, um, ideally I would really like to be a faculty member and continue to do research and continuing to teach. One of the cool things about my program here at UND is that we actually get to teach our own classes. Like students sign up. Oh, and that's I, uh, really cool. Yeah. And that's something I think is just really cool. Like it was one of the clinchers for me when I was applying. And um, mm-hmm. what just, types of classes have you been teaching? So I taught introduction to psychology. I've taught that at UND. And I also taught it at a community college, a Lake Region State College. And then nice. I've cool. been teaching developmental psychology. Now I'll be teaching it for the third mm-hmm. time this spring, um, which is nice. cool which I, I really enjoy it. Like um, attachment theory, again, again, my Bay theory um, is normally taught in a <laughs> developmental course. So um, mm. students who take developmental with me, they get a full week of, of attachment theory. It's, it's a fun week. That's it's so cool. Theory week. That makes sense. I mean, and, if it's your favorite, you might as well just like do a little <laughs> bit of a deeper dive into it while you've yeah, got their attention. That's yeah, awesome. Exactly. Exactly. And one of my favorite things I like to do is I like to tell students, okay, I want you to apply these concepts to the world you live in. Because, you know, simply having the right answers on a Scantron, you know, three times a semester right. and you, you forget about it, that doesn't really mean much, I feel like. I feel like just if we can actually apply course concepts, that's more viable. So I have students, well, first I have them take the self-report measures of attachment and then I have them. I have them have uh, their friends take it, and then they discuss that. But my favorite thing I do is at the end of the semester, they have to choose a, a character in, in, a, in a movie or a TV show, and they have to apply as many psychological concepts in the entire class in that paper about that individual. Wow. And wow. so I learned about this. I think it was my. Um, I took introduction to personality. Uh, okay. I think it was my junior year. Um, I love the class. Um, very interesting. And I did a paper on Ted Mosby. 
from How I Met Your Mother. Oh, from How I Met Your Mother. Yeah. And, so uh, what was your take on Ted Mosby? Because like I have my own thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I think he definitely, definitely tends to romanticize a lot mm-hmm. about things. He tends to kind of view things. This is, this is the TV show, right? This is the TV yeah, show, yeah. How I Met Your Mother. Yeah. yeah. Who's the actor? And, Who's the main character? I don't know his name. Um, I, I don't know the show. Anyway. So what I did was I watched the entire first season of the show. I had my little notebook, you know, just taking mm-hmm. notes about stuff. And uh, so I have my students do that. And I make frequent references to The Office. The Office is kind of like my show. Uh, I guess too, I like yeah. to watch. And um, I also like Parks and Rec as well. Well, I mean, that's just because Parks and Rec is, is an objectively fantastic show. <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. I would say the ending of that show, like, so the, the series oh, finale. Oh, I cried. Oh, I cried so much. And, like, it was such a great ending. But, like, between the ending of Parks and Rec and the ending of Futurama, I was just, like, not ready. And so for me, the thing that the kind of difference differentiates me between The Office and Parks and Rec was obviously both of them were very emotional endings. But the thing was, I felt mm-hmm. like I felt like inspired after watching the season finale of Parks and Rec or series finale. I was like, yeah, yeah go and like can keep doing this and keep getting your like grind on. Yeah. And so, yeah, I have students do that, uh, do a paper about that. So developmental psychology is a class that a lot of nursing students take. So I have learned so much mm-hmm. about Meredith Gray. Then I think, you know, <laughs> I never yeah. thought I would learn that much. Um, is that from Grey's never, Anatomy? Yeah, I've never seen Grey's Anatomy, and I probably won't, but um, I know all there is to know about Meredith <laughs> Grey. Um, and I'll well, probably I mean, read if more. they're already watching it, you might as well, like, do it on something that you're already watching. Sounds That's like you it. need to do some research here on, on, on Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just finished my second time teaching behavioral design and digital products. Which- oh. <laughs> Is that like teaching people how to design these apps in a way that's that's manipulative or is it kind of like being aware of how they're being done already? It's a little bit of both. It's so the wow. first half of the class, we go over more of like physiological stuff about the body, like the mind mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. I'll be honest, the physiological stuff is kind of like my, you know, it's not Bread my better. Yeah, it's not really my favorite necessarily oh Um, yeah um i don't know like i feel like some people are good at some things and some people aren't as good at some things and that's probably the area where i'm kind of like yeah you know here we are almost done with this and physiological meaning meaning people are doing measurements on on people's bodies in terms of like sweat and temperature Um, and stuff like that um it's more about like the different functions of the brain, different functions of the like nervous system, like different stuff okay. about like how like and stuff about like sensation and perception, like nerves and like rods and cones of the eyes and a lot of mm-hmm. right stuff that you know um we have we have a lot of great people at UND who study those areas, but I'm not one of them <laughs> kind mm. of thing. Yeah, that makes sense. But but then the second half we get in so the classes basically based around how to make products more more effective, user-friendly. And then the last one is addictive or as habitual. Right. Mm. And that's my, right. you know, time to shine. Like, here we are. We're reading, right. you know, papers that, I, you know, I know the author's name by heart and all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, we recently had them do the presentations on an application of their choice and how they could apply that hook model to it. And right. honestly, I, I really enjoy seeing what students are up to because as a researcher, it's important. You know, like if people aren't using a certain application as often, then I definitely probably shouldn't be doing research on that application. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, we had a lot of TikTok presentations. That's one application I'm not on. I actually got Instagram for the sole purpose of understanding how it worked for the purpose of maybe doing yeah. a study about it but honestly like i've been on instagram for a few years and like despite being on instagram for a few years one i still constantly forget it exists and like forever forget to post to instagram but also it just i 
I, I still don't like get how the algorithms really work. Like mm -hmm. the whole like hashtag thing for me, mm -hmm. I feel so old. Every time I'm on Instagram, I'm like, oh, I got to think of a hashtag. Okay. <laughs> what, what are the big apps that you use on a regular basis? Which apps are, are integral to your work and your social life and, and everything else? I would say the biggest one for me is Snapchat. Really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And is, is that professional or personal? I would say professionally, probably email and Twitter. Okay. Um, okay. Socially, I really like Snapchat just because nice. you know, the, the phone, like our thumbs weren't designed to text. You know, like we weren't, you know, right. created as people to be able to text. So every now and then I might, I tend to have some like kind of pain from doing that. So mm. I, I like Snapchat because then I can just record videos to responses being like, yes, you know, or no, or, you know, like. I don't have awesome. to text as much. I can kind of adapt in that sense. Yeah, I really so like you're having Snapchat. conversations with people. Oh yeah, it's Snapchat. almost like a like a stop animation conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so cool. So, so in your in your personal life, would you be able to evaluate different apps in terms of my usage of this app is a positive thing? My usage of this app is potentially a negative thing. Is positive and negative are they even the right words? I mean, you know, we talked about earlier about how yeah. like different types of screen time are different. How would, how would you, would you be able to, within your own cell phone usage, be able to rank different apps based on that? Because I mean, that's one of the big challenges is yeah. like trying to figure out how to, how to rank these apps for the larger population. Because unfortunately within the larger population, you're going to have a lot of variation yeah. for one person. Like you mentioned, YouTube might just be music. And for another person, yeah. it might be anxiously watching videos about how, you know, Trump is, is destroying the country or anxiously watching videos about how Biden is going to destroy the country when he gets yeah. into the presidency. You know what I mean? And, and so YouTube could be contributing to anxiety and yeah. it's so hard to evaluate that on a larger yeah. population basis. But I wonder even just like personally, if we are able to like sit down and think about, okay, these apps are, are, if I'm using more of these apps on a weekly basis, that's a good sign. If I'm using more of these on a weekly basis, maybe that's a sign that I need to like think about things. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think it's definitely, it really comes down to the individual. So right. one of the issues with, you know, saying using your phone too much is bad is some people are very extroverted. You know, they like to communicate. With right. People. Right. And so I think this I, one right here, I, I <laughs> would never, I have no idea who you're talking about, who would ever be extroverted, who talks to people. I clearly never talk to people. I <sighs> no, nope, never, not me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I think it really depends on the person. So for me, I know that if Snapchat is causing, you know, disruptions in the amount of work I want to get done. Or if, you know, mm -hmm. if I'm if I'm not using the application because I enjoy it, if I'm using it because I feel compelled to use it, then right. then maybe it's right. time to, you know, have a intervention in the sense of the intervention parties of how I met your mother. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it really depends on the person. And that's one of the complex things about it. There was yeah. a study out by... Amy Orban and Andrew, Andrew Sublinski. Again, I hope I'm saying his name right. So a big thing with the, I guess, well-being of smartphone use is looking at adolescent children. And so what they did was they they had a very large data set. I don't thousands of people. And what they did was mm -hmm. they accounted, they accounted for other factors not just smartphone okay. or problematic smartphones. Screen. They look at other things like how much sleep are you getting? Are you having lunch? Or no, sorry, are you having breakfast? Okay. Are you getting exercise? Right. And what they found out was the total amount of variance explained by technology use to well-being mm -hmm. was 0.4%. So Com compared to what with other variables? So other things like getting enough sleep was like explained 44 times as much. Other things wow. like having, uh, having breakfast is explained like 33% more. I might have gone those numbers switched around. Wow. but We're going to have to put this study up on the screen. This is so interesting. Good deal. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's kind of the idea is that if you don't consider other factors, yeah, it might, it's going to mm -hmm. be, it's, there's going to be more variance explained. But when you add in other variables, it can kind of take things away and spread out that variance a little bit. So yeah, that was one of the main things they did. Like, so in this sense... Technology use was still a predictor of well-being. It wasn't as like not much. Yeah, negligible. <laughs> Interesting. So, now I wonder, 
I wonder for some people though, maybe some, the, the, what, what was the variation between individuals? Like for some people, was it a big predictor and for other people, was it a non-factor? This was just collectively as a whole. It's, I don't know if Got they it. really went into the at particular level. Some It'd be studies, interesting to see what the variation was. Yeah, it would. Yeah, some studies have there was so in terms of you know is smartphone use an addiction or not? Again, I'm I'm going to say it right now it isn't just because there isn't enough research. It might be in the future, mm-hmm. but again, most of the research is focused on making fancy new scales. <laughs> right, <laughs> but. Yeah, uh, right. but there was one study that found that people who scored higher in smartphone addiction, their their neural responses when they saw like smartphone related cues were more heightened, more like right. old. So that could kind of indicate that you know they it kind of prompted craving in them. Yeah, they were but, getting more of a reward from it. Yeah, but yeah, for the, the most part, that's that's. That's what my paper is about, basically looking at the uh, 11 criterion for substance use disorder and trying to find existing research that supports or doesn't support the claim of being a behavioral addiction. And um, I'm right. having difficulties just simply because there's not a lot of experimental things. There's a lot of, you know, correlations and, you know, stuff. Right. But again, these works aren't considering other variables like the paper by Linda Kay. No, sorry, not Linda Kay. Right. Um, uh, Orban and Shablinsky. Orban and Shablinsky. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to send you an email after and we'll get the, the links to those papers so we can have them show up on the screen as we're talking about them. But no, this is, this has been such a wonderful conversation, Alex. Um, Absolutely. It, it's, it's so interesting to think about how the speed that, that technology is changing um, yeah. over like a five-year period and us just being, um, you know, what, six, six, six years older than you um, have even then an experience of like, having gone through high school with a totally different technological landscape or right. having gone through college with a totally different technological landscape. And then the people coming up behind you, like their experience of the world technologically is so even vastly different from that. Yeah. And recognizing how early we are at the beginning of facing these challenges as a society mm-hmm. that, you know, people like yourselves doing this research now is so important because society is just waking up to the fact that, Hey, maybe we should think about this stuff and figure <laughs> it out. And everybody has ideas about it, but we don't really have any good hard data. So it's, it's so amazing to see people like yourself doing this work, doing this research. And, and yeah, it's just been so exciting to get to talk to you about what your experience has been like with that. And we can't wait to see where this goes, you know, over the next few years, as you finish your graduate work and then, and you know, what type of work you're able to go and do uh, after that. So let's definitely stay in touch. We're going to, we're going to keep an eye on, on your work. And, and anytime you have a paper coming out in the future that you want to talk to us about or, or share with our audience, please reach out to us. Let us know. We, we'd love to have you back on the show to talk about your work and, and, you know, your, your insights into this field as this field develops, because, you know, it's so funny to think when you first started your graduate work, all this screen time stuff that we're talking about here, that didn't even exist. Yeah. You know, your ability to do this research didn't even exist when you first started being interested in it. So it's like, where is, where is, what's the state of the field going to be in five years from now? So yeah. we, we can't wait to follow that with you. And, and thank you again for taking the time to come and speak with us and share your work and your perspective with our audience. Uh, thank you again for having me again. Um, this isn't a everyday occurrence, so I'm very grateful for this opportunity. No, it's it's our pleasure, and we're we're happy to create this platform for people like you because uh, it, telling telling your stories is is what enables the population at large to have a better understanding of what's actually going on with the science, Mm -hmm. because unfortunately the media is not the best filter for it. And I think that these long form conversations are so important to tell the deeper story um, and give people a a better understanding of what's actually going on here. So we're really happy to have this, be able to, to give you this platform to do that. This has been fantastic. Awesome. I actually had one other question. Uh, you mentioned yeah. Shablinsky. You mentioned, was it um, Orban. Amy Orban, the, yeah. Orban, the, the Near Eyal book. Who, yeah. who else are you super inspired and influenced by uh, that is actively doing work in this field right now? John Elhai. How do you spell that? E-L-H-A-I. And an interesting thing about that is he actually, he is a researcher. He is a clinical psychologist at the University of Toledo. And he's okay. a publication machine. Like he publishes an ungodly amount of papers. Like it is amazing. <laughs> his, his process, he's doing something really good. He's always kind of ahead of the curve. 
And um, he actually spoke at my university, my first year in grad school. And um, wow. Uh, oh, wow. It, was, it was pretty cool because, I mean, the odds of that happening, you know, right. so rare. Just super low. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, very nice guy. I actually told him about my uh, True Colors tape study idea. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm. so he publishes a lot. He has a lot of colleagues. Dimitri Raz Ganjuk, he's another one. Uh, I think he's a postdoc right now. So he's a doctor. Linda K is another one I, I mentioned. Uh, we follow each other. On How do you spell her name? Last name? <laughs> K-A-Y-E. K-A-Y-E, Linda K. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna look into these people as well. We're we're excited to continue our research into this because this is such an important topic for us because yes. everybody that we're around is talking about this right now and and you know getting to to actually look at the research and the people yeah. who are really kind of trying to draw real conclusions mm-hmm. about what's going on here is it's just so important to get to understand that better. So yeah, thank you again for taking the time to yep. to speak with us today. Yep. Thank you again. And for um, in. kind of off topic, but did you hear Andrew Yang's planning on running for mayor of NYC? We we, we are did. so in the Yang gang. We yeah. are going to be involved in doing whatever it takes to get him elected. Are you are you a Yang ganger? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yes. It, I mean, it just makes sense at this point. I mean, so like here. So my my only thing is I would actually prefer him to run for governor and well, okay. instead of mayor. I think that he would actually be much more effective as governor. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I fucking hate Andrew Cuomo, our current governor. But I'm I'm happy. As, <laughs> I, I actually think I think mayor is a good place for him because it's I think fine. he'll he'll I be will able to mayor. I think but, he'll be able to do more with his policies here in New York City versus statewide because he's not going to face the same level of pushback uh, that he would in the state. Whereas the the city is much more progressive in thinking about these kinds of ideas that he has. I think that he could do some really cool things here that he could show the rest of the country then after four years or eight years in New York, Hey, these are, these are how we did this stuff here in New York. And here's how it could be successful for the the rest of the country. So I think New York could be a great test bed for these ideas. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a few blocks in New York city that probably have more population than my entire state. Like, so it's definitely a great, you know, <laughs> yeah. great test area. <laughs> I for it. probably walk those blocks. But yeah, like, so a good example of this. So, one of the cool things about living in Grand Forks is that I live, I can go to Minnesota in like three minutes. Like, I can get to Minnesota. Oh, wow. I live, like, we have an East Grand like a hop, Forks. skip, and a jump away. Yeah, we have an East Grand Forks that is technically in Minnesota, well, is Minnesota. And uh, that's great. As a grad student, we really don't get a lot of like oppor- really a lot of opportunities to really celebrate our wins. Like most of our wins are stuff yeah. like like you know defending a thesis, proposing a thesis, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I like to celebrate the small things, and I forgot what it was. I think I finished one of my sections on my paper, and I was like, you know, I'm going to Minnesota. So like I uh, I <laughs> placed an order. For a cheeseburger at my favorite, you know, restaurant in Minnesota, and you know, like I was like, oh, "Oh, I'm so fancy. Look at me going to another state for a burger." (laughs) And uh, (laughs) but you gotta celebrate. You gotta celebrate. Treat yourself. 2020. I I tell you what, Alex. Next time you next time you come to New York, which I hope is soon, we're taking you out for burgers. Well, not good. too I'm, soon because I'm, I'm a big still COVID out, but awesome. <laughs> well, New York is definitely definitely a good place to eat. <laughs> um, but I guess the thing I was trying to point out is that we have we have restaurants in Minnesota who are defying state ordinances of staying closed because they can't, okay. uh, you know, they can't exist. You know, they're struggling, right? And that's why right. you know I think let's put money in people's hands, you know, support yeah. our yeah. businesses, and then yes. You know, it, it just it all the problems that we've had would be easily solved by you know universal basic income. Like Canada is getting, you know, Canada. I live like I actually live closer to Winnipeg than I do oh. my hometown. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, we're really close to wow. Winnipeg in Grand Forks, and they've been giving the residents two thousand dollars a month. I was about yeah. to stay a day, which yeah. would be wonderful. Yeah. But no. yeah, I, I, I would like our government to uh, take some notes, please. That we are great. I don't know if you follow American politics at all, but we've we they passed the CARES Act in, at the beginning of the pandemic, which basically mm-hmm. gave unemployment 
extended unemployment. There was an extra $600 bonus a week for people on unemployment. All of that expired at the end of July. And since yeah. then, they have been unable to come to an agreement. This is the last week now, mm -hmm. supposedly, where they're going to be able to come to an agreement to pass something. And they still can't figure it out. It's, it's, it's the most obnoxious. unbelievable clusterfuck of of political nonsense because everybody mm -hmm. agrees that we need to do something and they 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 And they, they have can't. so many examples of places elsewhere where they universal basic income is actually keeping people from going outside. Mm -hmm. New Zealand is literally corona free again. Yeah. yeah. Like they just announced like they're like we're reopening the whole country. <laughs> we're good. Like we and, Gucci. <laughs> and Andrew Yang has done such an amazing job of leading the the call for yeah. for the fact that we need cash relief, specific cash relief. You know, it's mm -hmm. not just the businesses that you need to prop up. You need to give people money so that they have money to spend at the businesses so they're not getting evicted. Yep. And so that they can stay home and ride out this pandemic and we're not forced to have businesses basically saying we're going to stay open and continue doing business because we have no other choice. It's like yep. the government needs to step in and help out. And Andrew Yang's done such an amazing job of of bringing those ideas to the national conversation. And I can't wait to hear, you know, how he continues to to, to bring that forward. He now has his new um, organization, Humanity Forward, mm -hmm. which I've been following, everything that they do. Um, and we now have more candidates who are running for Congress mm -hmm. who are supporting universal basic income. These ideas are now out in the mainstream only as a result of Andrew Yang. I have been such a huge fan of his of his platform uh, since before he ran for president, even right when he first announced is when I first found out about him on Sam Harris podcast. Mm -hmm. And it's just been so unbelievable watching how people have taken to these ideas, which when I first heard about them sounded so extreme. Mm -hmm. It's like, are you, wait, you going to give people money for nothing? Like that's, that's just going to make them lazy. Like, you know, mm -hmm. like all the things that go through your head when you first hear it. And yeah. now fast forward a couple of years and it's like, people are talking about this and w as if it's a real possibility. And yeah. I'm so excited about that. That's so cool to hear that you're a Yang ganger. And one of the things I really like is how he places a value for people who are staying at home and taking care of you know, taking care yes. of you know, maybe their children yep. or someone like a grandparent, a mom, a dad, yes. a dependent of some sort yeah. about how like, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that probably is one of the toughest jobs anyone can do and they're not getting compensated yeah. for it and just being able to make yeah. it so people can do that and really yeah. showing, Absolutely. showing value that, you know, that they value those contributions. And it's, it's so interesting because when you phrase it that way, everybody goes, yeah, you're right. We do value that as a society. That is an Why important yeah. thing for us to have in our society. Why don't we actually reward it? And all of a sudden, boom, here's a method for for Easily you know for, rewarding. for changing that. Yeah. So yeah, we are so inspired by by Andrew and, and his campaign. And that's that he's like at the top of our list of people that we want to interview. So oh. we're gonna work our way up to him. We yeah. we talked yeah. to another YouTuber who is a universal basic income advocate, yeah. um, uh, Seth Underwood. He has a, a channel called The Dividend Report. That was a great um, a great podcast uh, episode for us. And we we definitely look forward to having many more guests who are involved in the, the universal basic income scene so we can kind of work our way up to get closer and closer to getting Andrew on the show because that's going to happen <laughs> sooner or later. Get ready. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Following, we are too. Following well, thank podcast. you again, Alex. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day. It, it has Thanks. been such a pleasure. I'm going to reach out shortly with an email um, okay. just so that we can like make sure that we have all the links correct. Yep. Uh, where can people find you online? Or where do you want to be found? Twitter. What's your Twitter handle? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I think it's just at Alex Holt. Holt with an E. It's a very Swedish last name. <laughs> Are you Swedish? Um, I'm Scandinavian. I'm Norwegian and Swedish. And so the, nice. the cool th so all my life, I've had that last name mispronounced. First instructor okay. at UND to pronounce it correctly. So you know, I took one of those gym classes. I took inter I took beginner floor hockey. We had the former head coach of the Swedish women's national hockey team teach that class, wow. and you know, he had no problem with that last name. He just yeah, he just thought, thought was it. like, oh, okay, I've seen this a thousand yeah. times. It's fine. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Well, my family, I'm, I'm a Fredrickson. I'm, my family is okay. Swedish from yeah. uh, Minnesota. Uh, so they... Minnesota. My great-great-grandparents moved here in 1908 and moved to mm -hmm. Chicago and then moved eventually out to out to Minnesota, Northfield, just south of uh, Minneapolis. So okay. fellow Scandinavian, yeah. holler at you from, from the same part of the, the Midwest. <laughs> yeah, so I checked so my cool. Twitter handle is just 
Alex, and then my last name. Holt, awesome. We'll put, we'll put that up on the screen. We're going to link everything in the description. Okay. Um, yeah, and we'll send you an email shortly with just clarifying all those links and the papers awesome. that we talked about. And awesome. if you could just send us a, a headshot or, or a portrait okay. uh, at some point that we can use for the thumbnail, that would be great. Okay. I'll, I'll try to find one or I'll Fantastic. go outside and have a nice winter snow background. I love it. I love it. Perfect. Awesome. Right. Thank you so much, Thank Alex. You. Thank you. Have well, a good day. It was day. lovely talking to you. Be well. Ciao. Have Bye. a great one. Thanks for checking out this clip from our show. To watch more clips or full episodes, click on our profile below. If you want to stay up to date on all of our new episodes and videos, click subscribe. And if you have any ideas for future guests or topics that you would like to see us cover on the show, leave us a message in the comments or connect with us on any of our social media channels at Funtime Program or on our website at funtimeprogram.com. We'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.